This is Danny Perez from the Center for Bigfoot Studies. It's uh, slightly past 3 p.m. Sunday, February 9th, 1992. I'm speaking to you from my home in Riverside, California. We will be going to a telephone interview with Dr. Grover Sanders Krantz from Pullman, Washington, asking him questions about the Patterson-Gimlin film made almost 25 years ago today. Uh, this is Danny Perez. We're on right now. It's 325. I'm speaking to you live with Grover Krantz from Pullman, Washington, speaking from his office at the university. Uh, Grover, my first question is, uh, what, when did you first find out what was your reaction upon hearing that a man named Patterson, along with his uh, colleague Bob Gimlin, had uh, collected a film of a Sasquatch? I was at the University of Minnesota <coughs> when I first heard this, and my uh, reaction was, wow, that would be real neat if it's real. I have no idea if it's real. Right. So, in other words, uh, Upon, upon first hearing at it, you were perhaps suspicious. Yes. At, in 1967, at the close of 67, October, uh, were you already closed to the idea that Sasquatches did exist in North America? No, I was quite open to the idea. I was, at that time, willing to bet pretty heavily against their existence. I hadn't really, at that time, thought through the odds. I wanted them to be real, but I did not think they were. If you can accept that. I, okay, I can follow. And uh, when was your first opportunity to view the film? I saw it, I think, sometime in uh, late 1968. And what was your uh, first, let me ask about your first, the very, your first subjective reaction of looking at the overall film. It sure looked real. Yes, it looked very real. I wasn't uh, sure that I wanted to accept it, that I could accept it yet. Uh, I wanted it to be real. It looked real, but I had to think about it. I wanted to get more information before I would be quite sure. Okay, just one second. I'm going to go convert back over to the other end of it. I think the speakerphone is breaking up on us, okay? Okay. Okay, we're on again. Uh, my first question again, uh, when was the first notification that a film had been made by Patterson and Gimlin? What was your initial reaction? Well, that was um, right away in the fall of 87, and I was in Minnesota at the time. And my reaction was, I would certainly hope it was true, but I had no reason to think it was real. I knew nothing about it. When was your first opportunity to view the film at any length? I saw the film when it was publicly shown at a local theater when I got to Pullman, Washington, and that would either be late 68 or sometime 1969. What was your thinking about, what was your subjective impression about the overall film? It co looked completely real to me. I couldn't see anything wrong with it. I wanted it to be true, but unfortunately I simply didn't know enough about it and I wanted to find out more before I could say for sure. Were you suspicious at the time because it was being presented in a circus-like atmosphere? The circus-like atmosphere was uh, a little bit bothersome, but I also reasoned that uh, this was the only way that uh, Patterson and his friends could show the thing. The regular media were apparently not inclined to touch it. Okay. Uh, I had mentioned yesterday in a telephone conversation with you about a separate footage, footage made by Patterson about the tracks left on the sandbar. Uh, have you never known about that? I've never heard anything about the separate footage of the tracks. I talked to Patterson at some length uh, and Gimlin uh, about the uh, film and all the circumstances, and I do not recall their ever mentioning that. And I've never heard this from anyone else until you told me. 
So, and you've never, obviously, you've never seen that piece of footage? Nothing of the kind. Okay. What year did you study extensively the film? The film I studied in the summer of 1991, just last summer. I had the film for a few years before, but this was the first opportunity when I could find a, a machine to view the film one frame at a time. And you, you've taken uh, written notes on every single frame? Yes. Um, sometimes they're just a short uh, note. Just I put a little line. It, the film was blurred. The direction of the line indicates which direction the film or the camera moved, and the length of the line, the degree of blurring. In other frames, I have uh, more comments uh, saying whether the creature is clear, what position it is on the uh, frame, uh, what other mark might be there, or some characteristic of it. About how many frames are there that show the subject? Well, there are 952 frames in total, and... Um, I'm showing the sh subject? Well, showing the subject, I would estimate about two-thirds of those. I don't have in mind the exact count, but maybe 600. Okay, so from from the start of the film on your copy to the end of it, there are 952 frames. Right. And how long uh, is the, the subject seen in terms of time on the film? About two-thirds of the time. Which is, which is in terms of uh, minutes or seconds, how, how long? Oh, the entire uh, film lasts uh, 53 seconds if it's uh, shown at the proper speed, which is 18 frames a second. How did you determine that uh, Patterson was filming at 18 frames per second? Oh, that's quite easy. Uh, by studying the uh, swing of the arms and legs, which have, have to function like pendulums, and I could calculate how tall the subject was uh, for each of the framing speeds, or at least a range of heights. And if it was um, filmed at 24 frames a second, then the thing had to be about three and a half feet tall. If it was filmed at uh, 16 frames, it would have to be uh, in excess of seven feet. And uh, at 18 frames, it would be uh, between six and seven feet. Okay. So, and, and, and as far as you're concerned, regardless of what uh, the Soviet analysis was, uh, you're, you're satisfied that uh, it was 18 frames per second? Yes, no question. There's no question in your mind? None at all. What about the size of the animal, the subject? Uh, how tall? Its walking height is six feet. That is, from the surface of the ground to the top of its head is six feet. Okay, and if it were standing, how tall? Standing against a wall on a hard surface, it would be six feet, six inches. It loses five inches of height because of leaning the body slightly and the knee uh, being bent when it's uh, uh, carrying the weight, and another inch because it's punched into the ground inch on virtually every step. So from your analysis, uh, which happened last summer, you tend to rule out the early estimates of the of the animal being six foot nine and six foot ten. Right. Okay. And uh, question eleven on my notes here: What would you assign a weight in terms of? Uh, you told me about the body volume. Yes, I um, measured the uh, body dimensions very carefully. Uh, initially, I used the John Green's measurements, but then I corrected these down slightly for a smaller body calculated the body volume, allowing for air thickness, and at the density of water, which almost every mammal is, uh, it came out to about 500 pounds. I could be as much as 10% off either way on that. So 500 pounds for a six-foot animal, that's, that's, really, a, that's really a heavy-duty machine. Yes, very heavy-duty. Okay. Uh, is there a possibility of, okay, this is question six. Uh, is there any possibility, as is mentioned in the Soviet Union, that Patterson and Gimlin actually got movie footage of the thing crouching at the creek? I would think there is no possibility. Uh, Titmus was uh, quite precise that the men and the horses were um, within 25 feet of the creature when they first saw it, and that it threw Patterson, well, actually, Patterson's horse fell over backwards and pinned him momentarily. And 
and the creature, apparently, according to their observation, stood up immediately and started walking away. Well, Patterson couldn't have gotten his camera out uh, uh, instantly, and, and he said it took him a few seconds to get it out and get it going. So there is no possibility that he could have filmed the thing uh, crouching and standing up. So uh, any re recollection of that uh, account would have to be only from verbal testimony and written testimony that they, the, any investigator would remember. That would be my presumption, unless somebody was there with a flying saucer and filming it there. Uh, there's no other way. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned you've interviewed both Patterson and Gimlin on several different occasions. Yes. And, and their testimony? Well, I got to know Patterson quite well and visited him with him. I wouldn't call it interview. I call it just visit as a friend and a curious person. Right. And interviewed uh, uh, Gimlin at some length immediately after Patterson's death and uh, chatted with him again uh, sometime later. And um, I'm satisfied that uh, they are telling the truth about what uh, happened as nearly as they can recall. Yeah. When was the first opportunity to... Uh interview either of them was it the early 70s okay now it would be the summer of uh 69 that i first talked to patterson and gimlin probably 72 and and even and even though uh you've lost well when was the last time you talked with gimlin that would be 78 at the um UBC conference. And uh, in 78, did his testimony seem about the same as it was in 72? Well, we didn't uh, cover the same subjects, but uh, we touched on a little bit, and uh, he had no reason to. He didn't indicate any change in uh, what was happening or what had happened. Right. Uh, you had mentioned you've never been to the film site, but only in the general area. Right. Looking for additional outside uh, evidence, I didn't see any great uh, value in seeing the particular site. And right. other people who have seen it, and they've given descriptions of it, and I trust them. Uh, I didn't think I would learn anything. Right. So, looking back, though, uh, what would you have given to uh, been on the film site like Titmus nine days later? Oh, I don't think that it would have meant an awful lot because um, I'm not a terribly good track man. <laughs> if I were the first and only one to see it nine days later, I think that would have been important. But as, as long as Titmus was there, he, he can see more in tracks than I can. So I will trust his judgment. Okay, and you, you're pretty satisfied with his written account of, uh, of what he discovered going back to the site? Yeah. Okay. The shoulder measurement of the subject, uh, how wide and how did you determine that? Uh, a little bit wider than 28 inches. And this was determined by um, measuring the visible shoulder width, uh, using a little trigonometry, calculating against the angle at which it was going away from the camera, and uh, then comparing that with the stature that I had established. And I got seven different frames where I could measure the shoulder and the stature in the same frame pretty closely. Uh, so, uh, and the, all the calculations agreed, and the angle was changing from one uh, frame to another. They weren't successive frames, they were scattered throughout. And the, every, all the calculations were very consistent. They all pointed to very closely, 28.2 inches plus or minus one. So I felt quite satisfied with that. And, and everything, so that would be the, the widest part on its body? Yes. And everything from there would just taper down? Right. Okay. Uh, have you conferred with Rene de Hinden about his on-site investigation and the circumstances surrounding this case? I'm sure we uh, chatted about this some years ago. I don't remember much about it, except that uh, he was trying to see if there was any flaw in it. In other words, trying to disprove it, and he was unable to find anything wrong. So I consider that uh, pretty solid evidence. Okay. Uh, what about its uh, the subject in the film, the manner of bipedalism, 
there's no question that it is walking upright on its two feet. Uh, See that clearly. Obviously, there's the, it's indisputable. But the actual manner of that walk, uh, is, is it typical of modern man? No, it is not a uh, human walk. It differs uh, in a few respects. And um, it's, uh, uh, it would be extremely difficult for anyone to imitate that walk. I've attempted myself, and almost every time I try it, I have to do four or five different things uh, different. I'll almost always forget and, uh, uh, one or more of them. It's very difficult to uh, keep everything uh, in mind. If we were, uh, unfortunately for Roger Patterson, uh, his movie is an, uh, of uh, movie-like quality, like you find at the movies. Uh, had he been able to get a footage standing perfectly still, with just moving the, the camera from side to side as the thing walked, and if we were to isolate just the, the head or the neck of the subject, would, would there be a bounce to it, or would it be smooth like uh, parallel to the ground? Almost completely smooth and parallel to the ground. This is one of the characteristics of the walk that's uh, somewhat different from human. Okay, if we were to take uh, a, a, a typical man and have him walk on the beach and film him, with a stationary camera just moving from side to side as that person walked, and we isolated, again, say, just the neck or the head, would we see a bounce, or would we see something that is smooth? There would be some bounce. So, uh, again, what is walking there is, is definitely, no doubt, in your mind, uh, different uh, in terms of its walk. Yes, it's not a human walk close, but the differences are very clear, and uh, I don't think a human could have imitated it. What, what about the knees? Are the knees coming up unusually high? Um, not, let's see. When uh, the leg stretches out in front, it goes perfectly straight. It contacts the ground, and then as the body passes over that foot, the knee is Instead of being nearly straight, as it is in a human, a flight bend, it's somewhat more bent. Then when the um, leg passes to the rear, the other foot's going forward now, uh, it uh, lifts the foot unusually high, kicks the knee forward in doing so. So, so would you say perhaps that uh, the movement of the subject in the film is exaggerated? In some respects, it's exaggerated, yes. But, but in terms of uh, for a living real, is it, is it consistent with a, a real, is it consistent with, uh, with itself? Yes. If you had a um, human uh, exaggerated to uh, six and a half feet tall, uh, multiplied the muscle strength enormously to a 500-pound mass, and everything was in working order, this is exactly how it would have to walk. Right. I have no choice. Uh, upon your frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the subject, were you able to see any detail surrounding the hand? The head? The hand. Well, the hand. Yes, I could see some. The, uh, in a couple of frames, uh, it was interesting that the fist bent a little bit, uh, or the hand a little more towards the body uncurl a little. In another frame, the wrist bent a little more to the outside, and the fingers were slightly more curled. And this is exactly the way an ape hand uh, works. Okay, so so it was. So you're saying the 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 hand was somewhat uh, like a fist. Well, it just the fingers are just curved a little bit. But the important thing is, as the wrist bends a little bit, the fingers curl or uncurl. Okay, and this, this, I mean, upon closer study, you could, you could start to make out how the hand was. At least in two frames, but I could make it out, yeah. Okay. What about uh, Bernard Heuvelman's comments about this piece of footage that he has uh, publicly and in, in writing stated that uh, the film is a man in a nylon suit? How, how do you react to that? 
Well, I'm afraid he's wrong. Uh, I know exactly all the reasons he's pointed to, and uh, I can see uh, the value, a clear value in any of them. He's got an, emo an emotional thing against that film, and uh, I don't understand it. But things like, uh, uh, he says it's a man in a suit, obviously it has to be padded, because no man is that big, and that big around, and you can see muscle bulge in the thigh, okay? do that with a padded suit. So, so in conclusion, as, as far as you're concerned from your own investigation to the present day, uh, there's no question that uh, what we see in that film made by Roger Patterson is a living, breathing life form as opposed to uh, a man in a costume or a machine. I'm absolutely satisfied of that, A hundred percent sure that it's that it's real. Yes, the 100%, not 98 or 99, 100%. So, 10 years down, it's almost 25 years since the film was made. Uh, from what you knew about it in 1967 and what you know about it today, uh, do you reflect differently upon those that time span? Well, it's just nice that uh, I was able to analyze it and become that satisfied. Uh, earlier in the game, when I had footprints to go on that had convinced me, I considered the film as good support. Now I consider the film just as good as uh, a number of footprints that I've seen. Right. It, overall, uh, for the Bigfoot mystery here in North America, it is, as far as you're concerned, is the Patterson-Gimlin film the single biggest piece of evidence we have? Not for me. One of several. There are a few sets of tracks that I consider just as good. Okay. Okay, I, I think, I've, uh, again, I appreciate your time, and uh, I've covered everything, again, that I wanted to go over. Okay, enough. Super. Thanks again, Grover. Okay, Danny. Bye-bye.